Hello and welcome to this first look exploring session looking at Andromana, or the Merchant's Wife, or the fatal and deserved end of disloyalty and ambition, a tragedy by J.S. Um, a, a play which may or may not be within our purview. It is slightly unclear. Uh, it's a play uh, that could date from 1642, which is the end stop of how far we're going, um, but also could have been written sometime during the Interregnum as well. So it's a little uncertain as to whether this is uh, this is something we should be doing. Uh, so opinions may change uh, where we go with this uh, further down the line, um, if it turns out to be a bit later than, than we should. But, you know, there is a slightly porous border. I think inevitably there's going to be a little wiggle room on that. So we're going to have a you know, look at it, but it's quite nice to uh, at some point start working our way backwards as well. If we think of what we're doing as a sort of jigsaw, you know, do some of the edges as well, as well as doing the, you know, the detailed bit. And obviously there's some sky that we're going to leave till later <laughs> on. And, you know, it's all going to get a bit boring when we do those bits. But, you know, because it's all very samey. Uh, but, you know, that's that's the mix you get when you do um, huge amounts of plays um, in a sort of uh, jigsaw metaphor uh so reading today <laughs> in this play we're not sure whether we should be reading or not uh reading a ramnes of plangus and artesio is hi alan in suffolk uh re reading uh inophilus andromana and a messenger later on is sarah blake jigsaw lover in germany uh, reading Ephorbus, a messenger in the earliest part of the play, and a captain is... Hello, I'm Lynn Freitas. This is Scooter. We're in the northwestern United States. And reading Nicites, Renatus, and, or, and Libaris, uh, or something along those lines, is... Uh, Lois in London. And I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I'll be reading stage directions and moving us forward. So we're going to start with Act 1, Scene 1, which is generally a good place to start a play. Enter <laughs> Nicites and Aramnes. Ah, have observed it too, but the cause is as unknown to me as actions done in countries not found out yet. Come, wench, my life to a brass farthing. Ah, as like as may be. Uh, we soldiers are all given that way, especially when our blood boils high and pulses beat alarms to Cupid's battles. We're apter to sally on a young flaming girl than on an enemy that braves it before our trenches. I ask it not to know his privacies, for if his freedom does not acquaint me with them, let them be secret still. Yet I could wish an opportunity to tell him a little circumspection would be handsome and set a gloss upon all. Times might be chosen of less public notice. It looks so poorly in a prince to be thus careless of his own affairs. Men do so talk on. Here comes in a Phyllis. If anyone knows, must be he. Now enter Onophilus. Your servant, captains. Saw you the prince today? Not we. We hope to hear of him from you. To strange a man adorned with so much wisdom should on the sudden fall off from the care of his own fame. I am his friend, and so I know you. But to speak plainly to you, he's grown my wonder now as much as other men's. I, that have found a sweetness in his company beyond whatever lovers dream of in a mistress, that as he spoke... Methought have smelled the air perfumed, nor could have wished a joy greater than living with him, next those of heaven. And those preferred them more, because I knew Plangus would be there. I say, even I of late am grown out of love with anything that's mortal, since I have found Plangus so far beneath, I will not say my expectations, but the assurances all good men had of future gallantry. He's melancholy now, and hath thrown off the spirit which so well became him. And all that sweetness which bewitched men's hearts is grown so rugged, so incomposed to all commerce, men feel he'll, fear he'll shortly quarrel with himself. Nay more, he doth not answer the fondness of his father's love with half that joy he used to do. 
It's now about a week I've observed this alteration. It shakes him like an ague once in two days, and holds him longer than a fit of the gout. They whisper about the court as if the king had chid him for it, and now at length found his haunts. A poor discovery. Who might not find a mount that would be so uncivil? I was about to follow him, but thought it an ignoble way, beneath the name of friendship, and so desisted. About four days ago, meeting him in the long gallery, I asked him how he did. Taking me by the hand, he wrung it, and after a sigh or two, told me, not very well. But he had business, and so we parted. I saw him not again in twenty hours after, and then I asked him where he'd been so long. He told me, as if he was ashamed to deny me such a poor request, I must not know. And when I told him his often absence was observed, Is it, saith he, I cannot help it, but it shall no more be so. And at the last he stole away. Since when, I saw him not. Oh, this wicked peace. Enophilus, is there no hopes of war? To lie at home to see our armours rust? We could keep the prince sober and merry too if he would but exchange his court for a camp. The king is old and dotes upon his son, is loath to venture him to danger. Yet at this time there is occasion. The Argives refuse to pay their tribute and are for certain preparing for invasion. Some say they have got into Iberia already. Nay, then there's hopes. If we could but find the prince with a buff coat again, I should be once more merry. And they exit. Everybody's worried about plungers. Um But uh, don't worry, there's a war. That'll, that'll cheer it. <laughs> but shake him up a bit. Um, that's that's always the cure all, isn't it? You just go, ah, oh, yeah, just just. Uh, uh, are you a bit, you know, all bit in love? Ah, oh, just just send him into battle. That'll sort him out. Uh, Lois. Yeah, I think uh, Nicetes must be the John Lowen part. He's always playing people like that: the bluff soldier, hearty, uh, likes a wench, likes a drink, wants war. Uh, look, looks <laughs> like him. Mm. Yeah, enjoying enjoying being uh, in that sort of vein, and it's it's as it's noted be noted in the chat. Uh, you know, it's starting mid flow. It's you know mm -hmm. halfway through. Oh yeah, um, the the uh, we, we've had that a couple of times recently, um, and uh, yeah, it's, it it gives the scene a nice little bounce to it. It's like, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, two people come on and start doing some exposition and some other people join them to expand on the exposition and um, I think we're, we've, we've got a sense of where the play is. Uh, Sarah? It's also quite nice because it's so gossipy. Mm. <laughs> I mean, they're all being very concerned, you know, so it's kind of like noble gossiping, but it's still <laughs> gossiping, you know, it's like there's the three of them there, like chatting about this this fourth dude who who is the prince and 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 while they're not bad mouthing him it is like all sort of very oh i'm worried he's gonna go to the dogs you know um which is just like just a really fun way to start because we don't really know who any of these people are but like we're already in a situation where you know you've got um okay they're not courtiers they're more like soldiers but they're basically bitching about their prince and it's <laughs> It's it's quite a fun place to find yourself starting off. Yeah, uh, though of course it, the, the the what's happening with the prince does have a wider socio political uh, mm -hmm. implication. Of course, you know the king's old. Uh, he dotes upon his son. Wars in the offing. Um, you know this 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 it, him being distracted is not necessarily a good thing for the state. Mm -hmm. uh, Lois. Yeah, Plangus is obviously the romantic lead in this play, and he's getting quite a build-up. I mean, some of the stuff that was just said about him is going to make it really hard for the actor to live up to it. Yes, turns up and looks totally different and is really unimpressive. That, 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 that you know, just... Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, um, uh, enter Pee Wee Herman. No, uh, act, we're going to go on somewhere else. Act 1, scene 2, enter Euphorbus the King. Renatus, uh, Euulus, uh, who I don't think says anything, and Aramnes, and, uh, uh, who are either the three lords or there are some additional three lords. Uh, mm. Anyway, Forbes the king starts us off. See the ambassadors entertained with such an evenness as should be used to men we neither fear nor love. 
Let neither too much obsequiousness teach them insolency, nor any ill usage brand us with incivility. Stay you, Renatus. And he sighs while uh, everybody else exits. <laughs> Open thy bosom and receive torrents of sorrow that lie like rocks of lead upon my soul. Honest Renatus, experience bids me trust thee with a mighty secret. Thou canst not choose but know, my son, of late is, is much retired. I do not like that youth should be thus melancholy. Let them enjoy themselves, for age will come, whose impotency will deny all pleasures. I do believe he loves me, huh? Oh, yes, doubtless, better than sick men health, or those who are penned up in darkness love the sun. I speak not as if I thought he did not, but thou knowest I humor him, afford him liberty enough. I never chide him, nor express the least dis dislike of any action. Am I not a gentle father? Methinks, were I a son again, to such a father I should not think he lived too long. Shouldst thou, Renatus? No more doth he upon my soul. One command of yours would make him venture upon lightning, nay, almost make him act a sin, a thing he fears to name. I do believe thee, but yet methinks he should, should he be grown so impious that might he, that might be found excuses. A crown is a temptation, especially so near one. Tis not with princes as with other sons. And I am told too, Hath not my hand a palsy? Doth not a crown become gray hairs? To be king might make some men forswear all conscience. But I know Plagueis hath for far nobler thoughts. Oh, Plangus, Plangus, how do we say his name? Uh, and yet an empire might excuse a parricide. Sir, Sure, you are a stranger to your son, for give me leave to say, your fears are vain. So great a virtue as the prince's cannot anticipate his hopes by any sin. Honor and duty have been acquainted with him now too long to be divorced. Some sycophants there are, such creatures still will haunt the court. I know love not the prince because he loves not them. Sir, shut your ears to them. They will betray you to your ruin. Jealousies, a disease, should be below a king, as that which seizeth on the basest spirits. Oh, shut it from your soul. One may read in story what dire effects the fury hath brought forth. Kings make away their only sons, and princes their fathers, and when they have done, they may despair at leisure. I do not think Plangus has plots or on my crown, or me. He has. He was virtuous always, and is still, I hope. But why is he so much from court then, and alone, too? I do but ask the question. It, it can be no design, believe me, sir, for crowns are won by other courses. Aspirers must grow popular, be hedged about with their confederates, then, would he flatter you, be jolly still, as if no melancholy thought were in him? A guilty conscience would then teach him policy, and he would seek to take suspicion from all his carriages. Innocence makes him careless now. Thou hast almost resolved me. The tempest in my soul is almost laid, and wants but time to calm it. Youth hath its whimsies nor are we to examine all the paths too strictly. We went awry ourselves when we were young. <laughs> Sir. Thou mayst be gone, Renatus. And Renatus <laughs> exits, uh, leaving Euphorbus alone for Act 1, Scene 3. Ah, the blessing of an honest servant. This Renatus is truer unto me. He loves the king as well as I, Euphorbus. And may I live but to reward him for he's too honest for a court. Enter uh, Artesio. How now, Artesio? Thy looks speak strong amazement. I am with child to hear the news. Prithee be quick in thy delivery. The prince, and please your majesty. What of him, Ar Ar Artesio? I have observed he's much retired of late. 
So have I too. This is no news. And I can whisper in your ear the cause. T'was chance. No policy of mine betrayed his privacies. Your offices are not the engines I desire to rise by. Only love to the young prince makes me reveal them. Nay, nay, without apology, <laughs> if it were treason, it should not go down the sooner for all the gilded preparation. Nor am I of so feminine a humor as to mistrust affection delivered bluntly. Plain meaning should be bold. Beware bad wares may have false lights. Good can abide the day. I know the nature of my office. Though kings still hug suspicion in their bosoms, they hate the causes love to hear secrets too, yet the revealers still fare the worse, being either thought guilty of ends or weakness, and so esteemed by those they tell them to, either unfit or dangerous to be trusted. Perhaps, sir, when the prince and you are friends again, you'll tell me that had my love been real, I should have whispered the prince's errors to himself. Without a syllable of prologue more, or I shall verify your fears. In this brave city, take it as brief as may be, there lives a beauty, fit to command them that command the world, and might be Alexander's mistress were he yet alive, and had headed the empires as large as his desires. She's but a private merchant's wife, yet the prince is so far graveled in her affection, I fear. Then there may be hopes I may recall him. Love is a childish evil though the effects are dangerous. A prince's errors grown public will be scandalous. Poor boy. Perhaps the jealous husband may commit a murder. I would not have him cut off so young. Love should love should be prince's recreation, not their business. What physic must we give him for his cure? I dare not counsel you, but in my poor judgment, some gentle fatherly persuasions will work upon so good a nature. Could stop but possibly affect how I might take him napping. That is beyond my skill, but I can show you the house and time he walks from hence in, which will be about an hour hence, but then her husband comes home from the Rialto. Time will not tarry for a king. Let us go. And they exit, so expansion on the sun um, uh, information here. I mean, everybody's worried about him. Uh, and I talked about the, 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 the socio-political consequences of, uh, of his uh, being a bit off, off form uh, being discussed here in different ways uh, with uh, Renatus here, who uh, is going, no, your son's fine, you know, he'll grow out of it. Um, whereas Artesia is going, mm, you know... Uh, ill offices are not the engines I desire to rise by. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believed you. I definitely <laughs> believed you. Uh, Lois. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, the king seems to me with something of an understatement, saying perhaps the jealous husband may commit a murder. My, I would not have him cut off so young. <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> That's my son, the heir to the throne. Yeah, I don't want him to die so early. Well, that would be <laughs> unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, wouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, that would just yeah. really put a crimp on my day. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's something rather, yeah, he's sort of, Doddering around, isn't he, Forbus? He doesn't see, you know, he's got all the right, you know, motivations here. You know, he wants good things to come out of it, but he doesn't quite feel like he's fully in the room. Um, <laughs> uh, Lynn, yeah, and uh, you know, maybe it's just because I've been re re listening to the uh, Edward the Fourth um, mm. uh, YouTube videos, like a merchant is going to murder a. <laughs> the heir to the throne because the that doesn't mm -hmm. seem very yeah. likely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, jealousy stuff, you know yeah. things, yeah. maybe, maybe not. Uh, Sarah. Yeah, I I was thinking of Edward the Fourth as well. Um, there's there's overtones of Jane Shaw here, isn't there? And I'm I'm it's it's interesting because we haven't met this prince yet, um, mm. and we don't know like. I mean, I was immediately thinking, oh, okay, he's he's taken a he's taken a merchant's wife for his mistress. Has he kind of, um, you know, is this a situation where he's sort of compelled her into it um, with his love? Um, 
you know, as in with Jane Shaw, or, you know, is, is this actually such a good prince as we've been led to believe? Um, or, you know, or, or is it that he is actually a good guy and this this unknown woman is leading him astray and this accounts for the fact that he's no longer, um, you know, the, the guy that his that his friends thought he was or or is the fact that he's no longer the guy his friends thought he was is that actually a good thing who knows we still don't know and it's really intriguing i love the way the, the all these little scenes are sort of building up our suspense about this character yes we we haven't met him we haven't met her uh we you know that everybody's talking about him um but uh, and we're getting little bits of information piecemeal coming in and it is yeah it's interesting uh lynn or um is the the merchant's wife actually kind of a smokescreen and he has other business that's mm -hmm. actually going on in in town or is artesio just flat out lying i think mm -hmm. those are both possibilities as well yeah i i i, I distrust artesio because he's doing exactly what uh renata <laughs> said uh people might do um <laughs> I mean, it's literally Arthur's just has said uh anyone plotting against you is going to be really nice to you um <laughs> that's 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 the way this stuff works and i do re i really like uh Renatus's bit you know uh, about how aspirers you know they get they get really popular they've got lots of you know they're, they're suddenly your best friend and all this stuff and then they stab you in the back uh, you know and it's a really reasonable bit of political advice actually for a man who clearly should know because he's been on the throne for a while um you know he shouldn't need someone to tell him that um but you know we the audience perhaps needed to know that <laughs> okay uh we are going to nip back to some people we've met before in a different combination act one scene four enter enophilus uh yes act one scene four yes what has become of this young prince? Or where doth he bestow himself? Doth he walk invisible? Where have I been to look him? The horses are in the stables, his page and I at home too, that used to be his inseparable companions. Enter Nicetes and Ramnes. Well, my gentlemen, where is the hermit Flanges? We cannot tell, nor have we been to seek him. If at the court we should hear presently, if not, we might be too officious in his search, and our inquiry might make his absence but so much the more notorious. And I'm confident he's well. His virtue guards him still from all mischances. Though his company's the dearest thing I love, yet for his good I could digest his absence, but that I doubt a mighty mischief might spring from this small grain of indiscretion. The king is old. And there are knaves about the court that, if he knew it not, would tell him so. And men conscious to themselves of a deficiency are still most jealous of a growing worth. Perhaps a thinking father, for plodding is old age's sickness, may take notice of his son's retirement and misconstrue it so. Nothing is impossible. And heaven send it otherwise. Which care becomes you, sir? I dare swear it is needless. The king is but an ill dissembler, and had he but the least thought of such a thing, he'd hide it less than the sun conceals his brightness. Besides, a man as great as Euphorbus is, whose rule of living has been directed by the line of virtue, cannot mistrust that vice in his own son, of which himself was never guilty. Had his younger years been tainted with inordinate desires, or had his crown been the effect of some audacious crime, perhaps his guilty conscience might have mistrusted. But tis impossible, where is no guilt, to fear a punishment. You speak my hopes. But this for certain, gentlemen, the king, who was admired for his matchless sleeping, whose night no noise disturbed, and it was difficult to wake before his hour, sleeps but unquietly of late will start at midnight and cry, Plangus, is greedy after news and walks unevenly and sometimes on the sudden looks behind him and when one speaks to him scarcely marks one syllable. Surely the mind of some distemper shakes his soul into this looseness? And enter a messenger. My lord, the prince desires to meet you half an hour hence in the gallery. Me? 
Yes, my lord. I shall. Your servant, captains? Yours, my lord. And they exit at several doors. We'll go straight in, because with the moment we've all been waiting for. Yeah. Act 1, Scene 5. Enter Plangus and Andromeda. It cannot be so late. Believe it. The sun is set, my dear, and candles have usurped the office of the day. Indeed, methinks a certain mist, like darkness, hangs on my eyelids. A too great lustre may undo the sight. A man may stare so long upon the sun that he may look his eyes out. But certainly it is so with me. I have so greedily swallowed thy light that I have spoiled my own. Why shouldst thou tempt me to my to my ruin thus? As if thy presence were less welcome to me than day, to one who, tis so long ago he saw the sun, hath forgot what light is. Love of thy presence makes me wish this absence. Phoebus himself must suffer an eclipse, and clouds are still foils to the brightest splendour. Some short departure will, like a river stopped, make the current of our pleasures run the higher at our next meeting. Alas, my dearest, tell those so that know not what it is to pass from blessing. Bid him not surfeit to take health sweetness that knows what tis to groan under a disease. Then let us stand and outface danger, since you will have it so. Despise report and condemn scandals into nothing, which vanish with the breath that utters them. Love is above these vanities. Should the innocent thing, my husband, take thee here, he could not spite me but by growing jealous. And jealousy's black effect would be a cloister perhaps to kill me too. But that's impossible. I cannot die so long as Plangus loves me. Yet say this piece of earth should play the coward and fall at some unlucky stroke. Love would transport my better half to its centre, Plangus's heart, and I should live in him. But, sir, you have a fame to lose, which should be a prince's only care and darling, which should have an eternity beyond his life. If he should take that from you, I should be killed indeed. Why should dost thou use these arguments to bid me go? Yet chain me to thy tongue, while the angel-like music of thy voice entering my thirsty ears charms up my fears to immobility. It is more impossible for me to leave thee than for this car carcass to quake away its grilled gravestone when it lies destitute of a soul to inform it. Mariners might with far greater ease hear whole sh shoals of sirens singing and not leave out their destruction that I forsake so dangerous a sweetness. I will be dumb then. I will be deaf first. I've thought away now. I'll run from hence and leave my soul behind me. It shall be so, and yet it shall not either. What? Shall a husband banish his prince, his house, for fear? A husband? Tis but an airy title. I will command there shall be no such thing, and that Andromana is mine, or his, or any man's, she will herself. These ceremonies fetter the world, and I was born to free it. Shall man, that noble creature, be afraid of words, things himself made, shall sound a thing of seven small letters, give check to a prince's will. Did you not promise me, dear sir? <clears throat> Have you not sworn, too, you would not stay beyond the time? Have oaths no more validity with princes? Let me not think so. Come, I will go, thou shalt not ask in vain, but let us kiss at parting. It may be our last, perhaps. I cannot now move one foot, though all the furies should whip me forward with their snakes. Woman, thou stolest my heart. Just now thou stolest it. Cannon bullet might have kissed my lips and left me as much life. The king, having listened, comes in softly. Are we betrayed? What art? Speak or resolve to die. A well-wisher of the princes. The king? It cannot be! He starts. 
Though thou hast thrown all nature off, I cannot what's my duty. Ungracious boy, hadst been the offspring of a sinful bed, thou mightst have claimed adultery as an inheritance. Lust would have been thy kinsman, and what enormity thy looser life could be guilty of had found excuse in an unnatural conception. Prithee hereafter seek another father. Euphorbus cannot call him son that makes lust his deity. Had I but known, but we are hoodwinked still to all mischances, I should have had a son that would make it his study to, I, had I but known, but we are hoodwinked still to all mischances, I should have had a son that would make it his study to embrace corruption and take delight in unlawful sheets, and would have had a monster in mine arms before thy mother. Good heavens, what will this world come to at last? When princes, that should be the patterns to all virtue, lead up to the dance to vice, what shall we call our own when our own wives banish their faith and prove false to us? Have I, with so much care, promised myself so pleasing a spring of comfort, and are all the blossoms nipped and buds burnt up by the fire of lust and sin? Have I thus long labored against the billows that it did oppose my growing hopes? And must I perish in the haven's mouth? No gulf but this to be devoured in? Would not use inclination find out another rock to split itself upon? Hadst thou hugged drunkenness, the wit or mirth of company might have excused it. Prodigality had been a sin a prince might have been proud in compared to this. Or had thy greener years incited thee to treason and attempt a, and attempt a doubting father's and attempt a doubting father's crown. It had been a noble vice. Ambition runs through the veins of princes. It brings forth acts as themselves, and it spurs on to honor and resolves great things. But this, this lechery is such a thing, sin is too brave a name for it. A prince, I might say my son, but let that pass, and dare to show himself to naught but darkness and black chambers, whose motions like some planet, all eccentric, not two hours together in his own sphere, the court. But I am tame to talk thus. Be gone with such speed as a coward would avoid his death and never more presume to look upon this woman, this whore, who's, who thou losest both his eyes and me else. Plantus is going out, but comes again. Ah, yeah, the reverence I owe my father and the injury I have done this gentlewoman. It charms me up to silence, but I must speak something for her honour. When I have done, command me to the altar. Whilst, I confess, you tainted me with sin, I did applaud you and condemn myself. It looked like a father's care. But when you used that term of awe to her that stands there, I would have given ten thousand kingdoms. You had no more relation to me than hath the northern to the southern pole. I should have flown to my revenge swifter than lightning. But I forbear, and pray imagine not what I had done. Upon my life, she is very handsome. To be a whore is more unknown to her than what is done in the Antipodes. She is so pure, she cannot think a sin, nor ever heard the name to understand it. No doubt these private meetings were to read her moral lectures and teach her chastity. Nay, give me leave, sir. But do not say my addresses have all been so virtuous, for whatsoever base desires a flaming beauty could kindle in a heart were all alive in me, and prompted me to seek some ease by quenching burnings hotter than Etna. Imagine but a man that had drunk mercury, and had a fire within his bones, whose blood was hotter than the melted ore, if he should wish for drink. Nay, steal it too. Could you condemn him? Married, do they say? I did endure a heat. Seas could not cool. It would have killed a salamander. Then, taught both impudence and wit, I singled out my foe, used all the arts that love could think upon, and in the end found a most absolute repulse. 
Well, Plangis, your excuse, youth excuses the first fault. But a relapse exceeds all pardon. Exuant King Ephorbus M. Plangus leaving Andromeda uh, uh, alone as we go into Act 1, Scene 6. Cursed be old age, and he that first numbered fourscore. What devil has betrayed us to a doting fool? Did I but now promise myself what hopes ambitious thoughts could reach? And shall I sink down to my first foundation without the pleasure of a tailored greatness? Death and disgrace. I dare provoke the utmost of your malice after the sweetness of some sharp revenge. Enter Libesa in haste. Madam, my master! You may both hang together. Oh, why, thus it is. If a man should kill his father for you, he should be thus rewarded. As soon as your turn served, I may be hanged that did it. Since he is dead, how was it done? Oh, why, nothing. Only, as he was taking water at the Rialto, his foot slipped a little, and he came tumbling in the sea, uh, whence he was taken up, but not alive. Heaven prospers not these courses. I see it plainly. Let them be acted with as much closeness, or to what end soever they never thrive. Liber, sir. We are undone. Undone! The king hath found his son here, and I have lost him to eternity. Ah, uh, you women are the shallowest creatures. You never look beyond the present. Rome was not built in one day, madam. Greatness is never sweet that comes too easily. Should Plangus be a fool now and obey his father? Ah, pox of this virtue. It spoils most men living. We have hopes yet. Revenge is something, and if my old trade fail not, princes are mortal as well as other men. Yet my soul inspires me with half a confidence that Leon hath not died in vain. I used to see as far into mischief as another. I'll go to him, and if I bring him not within this half hour, as hot and eager on the scent as e'er he was, take me and hang me at my coming home. Oh. Madam, uh, here is a messenger from court. As he is going out, he meets Artesio. Uh, Artesio. If from thence I may be bold to ask how Plangus, the noblest prince alive, doth? Madam, as well as soldiers can that are sick for honour, I suppose by this time hath left the court, and is gone in quest for glory, which he intends to ravish from young Argo's brow the valiant leader of the Argive's army. I am confident then, sir, your business is not to me. If anybody else hath sent you, sir, be pleased to spare the message, and tell them I neither have learned the tricks of the court, nor yet intend it. I want no new gowns, and have heard men forswear themselves in better language, and to better purpose than gaining of a lady's honour. Madam. My business is from the king. He doth entreat you, you would be pleased to bless the court this afternoon with your fair presence and bring an answer. I must not stay for one. Exit Artesio. Now we do see an end of all our mischiefs. The prince is gone from court, and the king hath sent for us. Doth not the name strike terror to thy curdling blood? <laughs> No, by my troth, not at all. As far as I see, you're better than you were. I'll lay my life the old man would turn gamester. Take my counsel. Play deep or not at all. Not an ace under a kingdom. Uh, your grace, I hope, will remember your poor friends. If I do find any such thing, let me alone to melt his ice. Go, get me morning with all haste. Exit Libesa. Uh, Let froward fortune do her worst. I shall create my greatness, or attempting fall. And when I fail, I will deserve my ruin. And exit Andromena. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. So we're gonna, and we did quite a chunky 
uh, number of scenes. So I, 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 I just briefly pull us all the way back to where we started. Uh, we have this once again a scene with uh, Enophilus and Aramnes and all sort of basically wandering around, going, "Where's, where's the prince? Where's the prince? Where's the prince?" And I was sitting there watching that scene, going, "Can we just have this in?" Can we just have tacked this onto the earlier scene when they were all on stage doing this? Because it's sort of, I'm not sure what it's adding, um, but there are adding a few things because I think there's a, they, they talk about the sun concealing brightness and it's immediately echoed in the following scene. So I, 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 though in a sense there's part of me going, get on with it, get on with it, get on with it, it does sort of set up the uh, they're definitely getting it on scene uh, that follows it because, uh, yeah... Uh, Langus and and Dromana are definitely um, getting it on. Um, I mean, that all looks uh, quite post-coital. I don't think there's any chase chasteness going on here. It's uh, then, pro- I mean, there's probably tongues when it comes to the kissing. You know, it's it's not little little things here. Uh, when when the king comes on, um, so yeah, lots of thoughts before we get to the end of the scene. I know there's a lot to discuss at the end of the scenes, <laughs> but uh, yeah, thoughts. Uh, I'll go to Lois and then Sarah, oh. then Lynn. Okay, well, I mean, first just a sort of silly point, but. I really was amused by that bit about the king being admired for his long sleeping. I realized admired means sort of wondered at rather than, uh, you know, an object of admiration. But still, it seemed like a really weird thing to say. I mean, also, if if this is post-coital, Plangus and Andromeda, then he's lying to his father later on, isn't he? Mm. Mm. Hmm? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 there is an interesting question of how much people are lying or, or uh, to, to each other because it does def- they're definitely hot to trot in that scene. Um, mm. But yeah, maybe maybe he hasn't actually uh, gone too uh, that far with her yet. But um, I think in my production he probably has. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's be honest, because well, this paragon of virtue is not exactly all that virtuous. No, yeah. and whew, there's uh, there's a lot going on there, uh, Sarah. I just wanted to say how much I love Andromana because she she totally had me. Uh, I was totally convinced that she was a Jane Shaw, you know, because she was so into him and like, oh, and I care so much about your honor and you sweet man, you have to go now, you know, your virtue is important. You have to maintain your reputation. I care for you so much. I totally believe that. I totally bought into that. And I mean, I know a lot of it depends on, on how how the actor's playing it and it's it's different when it's a cold read but like i just totally bought into that speech because it, not least because it's been similar to other speeches we've had from you know women who okay yes they've slept with somebody but they are essentially quite good people you know they're you know they're 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 not portrayed as virtuous in a play but they are by you know contemporary standards they're they're they're, they're good characters um and then we've just got this whole series of revelations. You know, the king comes in and she says nothing, which I think is quite an interesting choice in itself. Um, you know, she doesn't try to defend herself. She just keeps very, very quiet, very circumspect. Presumably is just watching everything that that uh, is going on. Then after they've left, she's like, oh, bloody hell, that old fool has found us. And it, it's immediately like, oh, OK, what? And then we learn in short succession that... Um, her husband's died and the prince her great love supposedly has gone off to war um or been sent basically you know sent away from her to get sort of get 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 him out of her clutches and she doesn't bat an eyelid she's just like oh god that's annoying that's that's like a really i'm gonna buy some blacks now i'm gonna have to yeah but but there's no i mean she doesn't even stop for a minute and go oh Oh, that was unexpected. She just takes it all in and she's off on the next plot. And I assume that end section was about was she's now going to go and try and seduce the king, which I'm just like, oh, well, I mean, the lady. King, the king is ready to be seduced. Oh, yeah. Yes, mean, because doing all these asides. That aside, life, she is very handsome. That um, aside was hilarious. So like <laughs> this is so much fun. I'm loving this so far. Yeah, and, and the thing is, I mean, she figures out that her husband has just died. I mean, it, the play doesn't quite tell us, actually, very explicitly at that moment. I was sort of but, going, hang on, has he actually done what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, because um, he does say, Art- Artesio does say, um, mm. no, no, not, is it Artesio? No, no, no. Yeah, Libusa. He, he, he does say that he was taken up not alive or something. Mm. Um, yes, but it's really yeah. not clear. Uh, no, it, It's sure. not very well articulated. No. Um, mm. I'll briefly Did go to Libusa. Did murder him? 
I mean, it's not really clear. He seems to be saying you're terribly ungrateful. I mean, it may be just ungrateful mm -hmm. to me for telling you this great news, but it could mm -hmm. be that he had something to do with this death. Mm. It's it's really unclear, and it's really interesting that it's unclear uh, as well. Um, it's sort of in passing. Oh, mm. this character we've never met, and who, who who might have been a bit murderous towards the prince, but that's a plot line that's clearly just been dropped. Um, yeah. Is 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 gone? And it's sort of yeah. It's really weird. Uh, I'll go to Alan before I go uh, back to Lynn. Yeah, I I must admit, taking on from Sarah's point, I'm not sure that she's going there to try and seduce the king. I suspect she's going to the court because she's been commanded there. And the king has obviously got designs on her. He's looked at looked at her and said, "Oh, there's a nice bit of tossy. I'll have some of that. Mm. I'll get the prince out of the way. You know, I'll send him off to the wars mm. rather than the oars." Yeah, um, uh, I'll go to Lynn. Um... Yeah, well, my response to this whole sequence was, "Well, that escalated quickly." <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, the beginning, the first two maybe three scenes of this are actually quite leisurely we could have found out much sooner what was going on like the prince is away from court a lot well it turns out he's got a girlfriend in the city and it takes us i don't know like 15 minutes to find that out what could have happened in the first few lines of the play so it was like the pace seemed really leisurely um uh and then all this stuff happens in this one sequence turns out the affair is is actually happening. Um, they get found out by the king. The king um, is overcome with desire for his son's girlfriend. Uh, and uh, and yeah, my interpretation of the libasser, libasser, lib whatever the the servant uh, and and Andromana is that. Uh, is that it was a prearranged thing that he was going to kill his master that afternoon. And, oh, by the way, I did it. I bet you're going to be ungrateful. And she's like, yeah, yeah, we got bigger problems than that. <laughs> the reason she doesn't respond very explicitly to that is like she knew that that was going to happen. Um, so, <laughs> you know, we've, we've got husband murdering. We've got, um, oh, I don't care who it is I'm having an affair with as long as he's the head of state. It's like all this stuff happens in like such a short amount of time. And the, the, the play had started out really taking its time to tell us what was going on. So it it, it felt very weird. So I, I wonder how that would play. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, this, this may be sort of uh, riffing on, uh, you know, but we can definitely say earlier forms of this kind of plot construction uh, that we haven't as of yet really done very much on. Um, but uh, by the time this play was written was was quite standard. I, I, I just like to speak to, we haven't spoken to, if Orbis it just goes off on one for hours. And it's like, and, and it's really interesting because it's, it's really irregular the, the way the verse is laid out. It's all very untidy. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering yeah. if it's just because his son is trying to get away and edgeways just go but um I, no dad look dad <laughs> yeah. uh, all right i'm gonna go and get a cup of tea and a banana i'll come back um it's like if he was on the end of the phone he'd just be sitting there just uh, doing something else um uh, but of course it's all about lust how could you give in to a lust boy oh hello that's the worst thing um, ever <laughs> So, yeah. so it's ridiculous length is sort of structural as well because he's just doing this to his son, to his son, and then he turns around when his son's talking and he's not listening to his son's response at all. He's just going, hello. Uh, Lois. Yeah, um, well, two things. I mean, one is that uh, it also seems remarkably dim that for him to say, you know, if you only wanted to murder me and seize the throne, that would have been a noble ambition. But instead, here you are off having sex with this woman. I mean, that's despicable. Uh, but also, it's not just this speech that's weird verse. I mean, the whole thing is weird mm. verse. You yeah, get the, the audience really verse, but... I, I'm I'm wondering whether one reason this is all going so fast is that we've got what is basically a first draft here. I mean, I think Ben Johnson said he wrote all his plays in prose first and then turned them into verse. And mm. uh, this almost looks like somebody just sort of getting it down on paper with the idea of smoothing it out later. It might be that none of this should be in verse at all. I mean, they, they, they could just be that it's been it's been ha hacked into this shape. And, and, and that's mm. that's sort of something mm. that happened afterwards. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 a weird play. It's from a weird time where there's, we don't really know anything about it. So all bits are off, really, in terms of textual accuracy. Uh, Sarah. Yeah, I, just to just to that point, I did notice because I'm playing, uh, what's his name, Inophilus. Um, 
his first couple of speeches were in prose. They were quite chunky mm -hmm. um, bits of prose. Um, and then he sort of suddenly segued into verse, which I found interesting. Um, but that would, yeah, that would fit with that with that theory. Mm, yes, I mean, uh, this, this is a textually very weird text. So, um, yeah, I, I, really seriously, all bets are off in terms of that. Um, but, uh, yeah, we will see as we're going to go into Act 2 and find out what happens next. Um, OK, Act 2, Scene 1, enter Plangus, Nicetes and Aramnes. What, sir? And are you melancholy when fate hath showered a happiness so unexpected on us? This ugly, sneaking peace is the soldier's rock he splits his fortune on, bawdries of virtue to it. Oh, these beaver hats, they make one's head ache, worse than a cap of steel, and bear off, not off a knock, the tenth part so well. You're mad for fighting, gentlemen. We shall have enough of it. The Argives, 50,000 strong, have like a whirlwind, borne down all before them. I, with 13,000 that remain yet undisbanded of the last expedition, have command to fight that multitude of old, tough soldiers, while ours, in a month or two, won't have picked up that valour that in this idle time hath slipped from them. They have forgot what noise a musket makes, and start if they but hear a drum. Are these fellows either now or fit on whom a kingdom's safety should be built? Indeed, were they to encounter some mistress or storm a brothel house, perhaps they'd venture, but for my part, I yield. Nor would I oppose my father, if he sees good we perish. I am already sacrificed, yet our enemies shall dearly purchase their victory. Pray look to your charges, Nastis, and you, Haramnes, with all speed and care and speed, and when you come into the field, then let me see this countenance, that frowning smile, and I shall like it. A lover man runs laughing upon death, but we lose time in talk. And exuant Nicites and Aramnes, Act 2, Scene 2, enter Enophilus to Plangus. Try that again. Your servant, captains. Uh, pray, sir, pray a word with you. Will you be sure, Enopolis? You know my business. Sir, I am mad to see your tameness. A man bound up by magic is not so still as you. Nothing was ever precipitated thus, and yet refused to see its ruin. Thou art tedious. I shall not tarry. You are made general. I know it. Against the Argives. So? With thirteen thousand men. No more, sir. I'm glad on it. The honour is the greater. The danger is the greater. You will be killed, sir, and lose your army. Is this all? I care not. But so do I, and so do all your friends. I smell a rat, sir. There's juggling in this business. I am as confident of it as I am alive. The king might within these this twenty-four hours have made a peace on fair conditions. But dishonourable. And would not on a sudden use the ambassadors scurvily and provokes the Argives, yet himself in no posture of defence. But... Pray give me leave, sir. After this, you are on a sudden created general and packed away with a crowd of unhewn fellows whose courage hangs as loose about them as a slut's petticoats. Sir, he had other spirits in the court created for such perils. Excuse me, I know you fear not to meet destruction, but where men are sure to perish, twere well the persons were of less concernment. He might have let you stay till you had gathered an army fit for your command, and sent some petty things upon this expedition, whose loss would have been nothing, and of whom it might have been recorded in our story as an honour that they died monuments of the king's folly. But let that pass. You'll say, perhaps, you only have a spirit fit for such undertakings. <clears throat> I wish you had not. Your want, then, would not be half so grievous. But here's the prodigy. You must fight them presently. Come, 
Tis a project put into the king's head by some who have a plot on you and him. It may be so, Inopolis, and I believe all this is true, you tell me. It might startle a man were less resolved than I. But danger and I have been too long acquainted to shun a meeting now. I am engaged and cannot any ways come off with reputation. Had you told me this before, perhaps I might have thought on't, and yet I should not neither. The king thinks I am grown dangerous. It is all one to me which way he takes me from his fears. He could not do it handsomer than this. It makes less noise now. But come, I must not fear such things, Inopolis. The king hath more virtue and honour than to do these actions, fit only for guilty souls. Nor must I fear when my Inopolis fights by me. A troth, sir. Uh, for all your compliment, if you have no valour but what owes itself to my company, you're like to make cold breakfast of your enemies. I have other business than to throw away my life when there is so much odds against it. I'll stay at home and pray for you. That's all, sir. Oh, well, we'll not go then, Inopolis. The time hath been I thought it better sport to bustle through a bristly grove of pikes, when I have courted rugged danger with hotter desires than handsome faces, and thought no woman half so beautiful as bloody gaping wounds. But, sir, to go and call away myself now would not be gallant, nor an action worth my envy. Tis weakness to make those that seek my ruin laugh at my folly, with jaws stretched wider than the gulf that swallows us. I know when honour calls me, and when treason counterfeits her voice. Well, stay at home and freeze. Lose all sense of glory in a mistress' arms. Go, perish tamely, drunk with sin and peace. Amass thou, since thou darest not die with them, outlive thy noble friends. I thank you, sir, but I cannot be angry. Act 2, Scene 3, Enter Nicetes and Aramnes with some captains and soldiers to Plandrus and Anopheles. Oh, muted at present. Yonder is the bones of the army, rallied up together, but they look rather as if they came home from being soundly beaten. They think such tattered rogues should never conquer. Victory would look so scurvily among them, they'd so bedaub her if she wore clean linen. Sir, we wear as sound hearts in these torn breeches as e'er a courtier of them all. We are not afraid of spoiling our hands for want of gloves, nor need we almond butter when we go to bed. And though my lieutenant is pleased to be a little merry, you shall see us die handsomely in these old clothes as those who wear better and become our wounds as well, and perhaps smell as sweet when we are rotten. We hope it, captains and fellow soldiers. We are proud of this occasion to try your valours. You shall go no farther than your prince doth. I'll be no bringer up of rears. Let not the number of the foe affright you. The more they are, the more will the honour be. The lion scorns to prey upon a hare nor is the blinking taper fit to try eagles' eyes. The weight of glory makes our danger light. When victory comes easy, tis half a shame to conquer. Yay. Soldiers shout. Yay. Don't know what. <laughs> and they exuant. <laughs> I'll stay at home and grieve that so many daring souls should die on such advantage. Exit Enophilus. End of scene. I, I like Enophilus because he just goes, this for a game of soldiers. Um, I mean, he just literally just goes, I am not going on a suicide mission, mate. I'll go to a proper battle. Um, and I so just, the way they're just going, who are these people you've got fighting for you? Where the hell did you get them? I mean, budget discount soldier store or what? I mean, it's just... It's just, there's something, I mean, it, we are laughing because there is something quite f uh, funny about this, but it's also quite effective as well. It's sort of a weird balance between the two. I, I just love the way Enophilus just interrogates him. You are the general, aren't you? you know, and these are the thing. And he's only given you 13,000 men. Now, 
have you been? Are you aware well, of some of our previous campaigns? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, Sarah. Yeah, and what what I love about him is that, well, like as as far as I know, um, he doesn't. In in, in doesn't know about uh, Andromana. He doesn't know why Plangus is being sent away, because all that happened between the king and his sons. So. You know, last we saw of him, he was like, what the hell is wrong with Plangus? And so he goes from that to like, oh, now the king's sending him away with such a tiny army. It's basically a suicide mission. What the hell is going on here? So it's great watching him because you can sort of see that he knows. He's smart enough to know that something is up. And he says, you know, there's somebody working against you here. But he has no clue that it's actually the king himself that's doing this on purpose because He's desperate to get his son away from this woman at any cost. Um, and I'm now beginning to think, yeah, is he desperate to get his son away from this woman at any cost because he wants to stop his son from slipping into further sin? Or is it so that he can have said merchant's wife for his own delectation? I mean, to kill your son in a suicide mission is a rather excessive. It's, it's uh, you know, thing. if you send, but then if he's, maybe maybe the dispatches got mixed up, and he's not supposed to have this. You know, that that's someone below the king confusing these things. I don't think so. I think the king's just, no, just and it's it. like thirteen thousand. You know, he says what thirteen thousand men. It's clearly like not enough. It's I mean, I don't know how many he should have, but it's like it's clearly like at least half of what he should have anyway. I mean, yes. <laughs> So, you know, it's kind of, it's looking super dodgy. And, and I love the fact that he can tell it's super dodgy, but he has no idea why. I also just love the way, you know, he, because uh, Plan just, just seems to be on this different planet of just going, ah, it will be more noble the the more, the, the, the greater the odds, the greater the glory. And it's like he almost, he's now, he's just, he's just in this weird zone maybe it's because he's so traumatized because you know he, he knows the jigs up and he's never going to see his love again and he's just going to go on and he's going to embrace it or he's just that guy of just no i'm going to embrace honor and things and it'll be fabulous and so yeah it's doing really weird things <laughs> and i say it's it's all for effect isn't it i mean this is the thing yeah. I, I i don't think i i think we can actors can do a lot of interior work with this play but I don't think the play is necessarily giving it to them in it. You know, it, it is all very exactly. surface and it's, it's, I'm having a lot of fun with it, but it is, uh, it is clearly ridiculous in so many ways. Uh, Lynn. Yeah. The, um, the characterizations are not terribly complex. Uh, you know, um, Plantus is just noble. He couldn't help it that he fell in love with another man's wife. Um, and Eo Forbes, if he's doing what I think he's doing, sending his own son on a suicide mission, not to mention sacrificing the lives of more or less all of an army of 13,000 men, when he could have solved the problem a couple of different ways, according to Anopheles, he could have negotiated a peace, um, at least bought time that way. He could have sent a more experienced general and more experienced soldiers I'm pretty persuaded by his argument that this is a setup. Um, so the, the, the so if he's right, the king is willing to to get his son killed, get thirteen thousand of his um citizens of his subjects killed, in order to get laid. I mean, that's like really shallow. Um, that's like really messed up. Um, values. That's that's not good. And, and it's really <laughs> weird when you consider the character of the king at the beginning of the play. We're so going, oh, isn't he sweet? He's sort of bumbling he about, isn't he? He's a little it's bit of a like... bumbler, but you don't... No. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's not really... So he's totally bad. The son's totally good. The girlfriend seems to be totally amoral. So, yeah, the... These are not the most subtle and complex and persuasive characterizations I've ever seen. Oh, well, but that, maybe that's not what the play is trying to do. It's no, like, I mean, it's not a long play. We're only doing this over two sessions. And the thing is, the shorter the play, the the, the more I, you see more uh, quite a few plays like this, where you're sort of going, if this was in the modern world, this would be a, a high concept film, uh, which always means that it's, it's a two sentence job that someone's just put together. Um, and you know, the film will be big bangs and flashes and, and, and exciting action and, and people doing speeches. Um, but you know, that, that, that's what it does. And it seems to be doing 
doing that quite well. I'm, I'm, I'm gripped. I'm enjoying the ride. I mean, I don't know how many times I'd want to watch this, um, <laughs> but then it, it, it feels like a cult classic to me. Um, I, I, that, that, that's how I'm feeling about this. Is that it's the the kind of thing you sort of you 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 go with. You just go with it. Let's find out what happens in the rest of Act Two, shall we? Oh. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes. <laughs> Uh, act two, scene four. Enter the king alone. Her husband dead too. Fate, let me die. I am too happy to remain long thus without a ruin, great as the height I fell from. Flanges was my only obstacle, but him I have removed. But love commanded his presence would have countermanded all attempts. <laughs> I need not fear his magic at a dist at this distance. His looks and actions were one entire enchantment and powerful over a lady's heart. I sent for her, but she's not come yet. Who waits without? Enter Artesio. Uh, there's a mourning lady, sir, would speak with the king. Admit her and be gone. Exit Artesio. Act 2, scene 5. Enter Andromana in mornings with a hood over her face, which she throws up, Scottish widow style, when she sees the king. <laughs> So riseth Phoebus from the gloomy night, while pale-faced Diane maketh haste to hide her borrowed glory in some neighboring cloud, envying the beauty of the newborn day, when darkness crowds into the other world. She kneels. Adam, why kneel you? You, at whose name monarchs themselves might tremble, and mortals bow with reverence great as they pay to altars. Scepters should break in pieces and adore you at whose sight the sun and moon should blush themselves to blood and darkness, and falling from their sphere, crush the audacious world to atoms for daring to behold a luster so much greater than their own. Sir, give me leave to wonder what sin I have committed, which calling down the vengeance of the gods hath made me author of all this blasphemy. Sir, I beseech your majesty, if you are angry with your creature, speak some cruel word and blast me. Scorn me not into the other world, where I have sins enough for, of my own to blush for, and shall not need to dye his cheeks for other men's offences. Lady, though Parthian darts are not so sharp as those killing words, yet that breath which utters them is sweeter than the morning dew. I'll be dumb, for praises cannot add, but rather diminish Andromano's word. I wonder now no longer at this language. Tis such as kings are bred in. But I beseech you, sir, if there be aught you will command your servant, if Andromana must do or suffer anything for great Ephorbus, lay by yourself a minute, and remember a merchant's wife must hear you. Your husband Leon's dead, I hear, lady. She weeps. <laughs> Nay, spare those pearls, madam. Cast not away such treasure upon the memory of one who, if the best of men, deserves them not. Come, come, forget these sorrows, lady, and wear not mourning weeds before the world's destruction. Hide not those fair eyes whose splendor would enrich our court. Madam, though none there be in court can merit such a beauty, yet I myself, have taken pains to search a husband for you. What think you of myself? Great sir, your care is like yourself, all noble, but suits with me no better than Phoebus' horses did with Phaeton, ruin the world and him. First, sir, you do debase yourself to honour her whose worth is less considerable than lovers' oaths. My husband's ashes are scarce cold yet. And would your majesty have me forsake my honour and his memory so soon? I have not paid oblations due to his ashes yet. You compliment away the worth we know you have, Andromana. What say you to the prince? I say he is the prince, and great of Forbes' son. He's Plangus. And if you think there yet remains a title that can be either better or greater, I think him worthy of it. Dost think him worthy, Andromana? 
No heavens! Is Jove worth heaven? Or doth the sun deserve to be a light to all the world? Can virtue deserve honour or labour riches? Can gods merit altars? It might have been a puzzling question to them whose ears have not been blessed with Planga's worth. But this? Tis so below him. But say he loves thee. I dare not say so. For when I think a prince pretends to such poor things as I am, I feel an ice run through my veins, and my blood curdles into flakes of snow and bids me fear him, not with an awe or reverence, but as a spotted, sinful thing, which is the worse for being great. Tis such a fear as I should conceive against an armoured ravisher. These things may be expected, lady, I confess, from blood that boils in flames as hot as the sun in scorching Libra, or sturdy Hercules when he unmaiden fifty in one night, or from a man whose years have tamed those vices, whose love is dotage and not lust, who doth adore a handsome virtue and pays his vows to it, you should have other hopes. Plangus is young, a soldier, and by consequence something which youth excuses. But if Forbes hath left those toys behind him when he shook off youth. Sir, now my fears are out. O oh, virtue, are there just powers which men adore and throw away their prayers upon, that lend their eyes to human actions? Or was the name of heaven invented to still petty sinners? Sir, sure I am mistaken. You are not great if Forbes, sir whose virtue is a theme of wonder to all neighbour nations. Uh, pray, help me to him. I would see that angel, the kingdom's honour and good men's sanctuary. But if you are the man whom I have prayed for oftener than I have slept, pray, sir, belie not a virtue which I have hitherto admired? I see you are a stranger, lady, and give me leave to say so to Iphorbus. But if the lady of thy melting years can love this grayness, I vow my scepter, throne, and kingdom, and myself are thine. Thou art fit to be a queen. She starts back. <gasps> a queen? Sir, have your subjects angered you? Have they rebelled or done some sin that wants a name? I'll cleave to the pavement till I have begged a vengeance great as their crime. But this you mention is a punishment which your subjects must study years to curse you for. No sin deserves it. You would blind my eyes with throwing gold before them, or set me up so high on the steep pinnacle of honest temple that you would have me not be able to look down on my own simplicity. You can create me great, I know, sir, but good you cannot. You might compel, entice me too, perhaps to sin. But can you allay a gnawing conscience or bind a bleeding reputation? I did never hear that physic could afford a remedy for a wounded honour. Thou art a fool, Andromana. You must be mine. Consider on it. Sir, you may command your vassal. That's kindly said. But I humbly take my leave. Goodness protect you. And Act 2, Scene 6. Enter to you, uh, Forbus, uh, Renatus, uh, uh, Eudilus, and Ramnes. Wait on that lady forth. Would there were not a woman in the world, so we had our prince again. Sir, are you mad, or have forgot you are a father? You have undone us all. Why, what's the matter? Oh, sir, the prince! He's not dead, Renatus, is he? Sir, if he be, tis you have murdered him. Was it for this you were so jealous t'other day? May my Enophilus never pretend to virtue. I'll teach him a more thriving art. Um, it's not got to do with anything. Uh, come to the window a little, sir, and hear how the good people curse you. As cold weather as it is, some are so hard at it, they sweat again. Pretty unriddle. Hast thou drunk hemlock since I saw thee last? 
I would not be in my wits for anything in the world. My grief would kill me if I were. He's mad that we'll speak sense or reason. Now you have thrown away our prince thus, whose innocence was clearer than his own eyes. Can you think how you have murdered so much virtue and not blush yourself to death? I think indeed I sent him general against the Argives, but twas his own desire. Oh, twas not his own desire, sir, to have but thirteen thousand men, sir, was it? Was that army fit to oppose great Argo? There came a messenger just now that saw the prince not sixteen miles from hence, for thither is the foe marched, draw up his men to engage the enemy. For heaven's sake, Renatus, port him back again, bid him retreat, command my son from me not to go on till greater forces follow him. If it be possible, redeem the error. I give my kingdom life or anything it were to do again. Oh, I'm glad to see this now. Heaven send it been too late. Nay, stand not prating. A horn within. Oh, tis from the army, sir. Oh, heaven, I fear. If from the army, pretty put on better looks. Enter messenger. This is me, yes. Yes. Your son, nay more, your dying son, commanded me to bring you word he died true to his honour, king and countryman. Nor let me stay to see the brightest lamp go out that ever graced this orb. The king faints. Oh, heaven, the king. Why, this is worse, sir, than the other. Let us not lose you both. Let me but hear how twas he made his exit, and then my glass is run. I will not live one minute longer. Sir, thus it was. Tis scarce three hours ago since the brave Plangus marched from Lixa with an army, whose souls were richer than their clothes by far, though their valour had put on all the bravery that soldiers ever wore. The prince, whose presence breathed new fire into these flaming spirits, resolved to meet the enemy with his handful, and with a winged speed fell down to the Elean Straits, determining there to try it with him, his soldiers also true sons of war, condemning so great odds when victory and their country was to crown the conquerors, whetted their eager valours with impatient expectation of the enemy, who, trusting to his multitude, came on winged both with scorn and anger, to see that paucity should dare dispute with victory against their odds. Plangus, who thought, who, who though he saw, yet could not fear destruction, and scorned to avoid it when the king commanded him to meet it, marshalled his army to the best advantage, and having given Sapiro the left wing, the body to Avanis, himself chose out the right, because he would be opposite to Argo, and keeping a reserve, as great as could be hoped for from so small a company, not above five hundred men, he gave the command of them to Zenon, who with his fellows took it ill they should be so long idle and had not the honour to be thought worthy to die with the most forward, and would no question have refused the charge, but that the smiling prince promised them they should have time to die. Words here were needless, nor had he time to use them. What? Uh, was Enophilus idle all this while? I only heard the prince wish, just as he spurred his horse against the valiant Argo, he had fewer by a thousand men, so, ha so he had Enophilus. Oh, traitorous boy. The prince and Argo met, and like two mighty tides encountered. Here death put on her sable livery, and the two gallants, whose valour animated each army, banded a long time with equal force, till at last great Argo fell. And on a sudden, multitudes of men accompanied him, so that the wing went presently to rout and execution. Zapiro also, and Ivanis, having slain their opposite leaders, breathed death and destruction to their reeling foes. Thus, flushed with victory and blood, the Iberians reveled through the flying field, till there came on the enemy's reserve of twenty thousand men, who, fresh and lusty, grinded their teeth for anger at their fellow's overthrow, 
and pouring on our weary soldiers, turned the stream of victory. But the prince's valour and good fortune soon overcame this opposition, and having rallied his broken troops, went to relieve his friends who had fared worse, when presently he saw Ivanis, who had piled up enemies about him as an obelisk of his own death and victory, fall bleeding at his foot, and having kissed it with his dying lips, entreated him to save himself for a more happy day, and died. "'Twas not long after the gallant Zenon, who had performed that day deeds of eternal fame, and with his few, spite of opposition, thrice charged and routed some thousands of the enemy, expired, which when the prince beheld, weeping for anger, he flew among his enemies, sustained only by the greatness of his courage, for blood and strength have both forsook him. He spent that spark of life was left in him, in slaughter and revenge, when, leaning on his weapon's point that dropped with blood as fall as he, he then conjured me with all speed, only to tell the king I saw him die worthy of his father and himself. A horn without, and a shout. Oh, oh heavens, what mean these acclamations? A shout again. Huzzah! What? Do the Iberians welcome their bloody conquerors with so much joy? Act 2, scene 7. Enter to them. Plangus, hey. Inophilus, and Zopiro captains. Oh! Oh! And the king faints again. Oh, cowardly boy, for that base word includes all baseness. Doth not shame kill thee, or fear chill thy dastard blood to an ice at sight of that most noble injured ghost? Tis well, dear Plangus, if thy divinity deserve not a more lasting name, that thou art come to take revenge on that most traitorous son in his father's presence, who detests his baseness more than thyself can do. Here's a stare in Arthas, but wonder crows to such a silence, if when we expected such a welcome, as had that Roman son whose mother died with joy to see him, we found so cold an entertainment. Something made us looked upon so like an inconvenience that we could not but put on some small amazement. And do I hear thee speak again and see thee, or only dream a happiness whose reality the stars and my genius deny me? Oh, art thou Plangus Angel, come to rouse me from despair? Sir, pray believe it, and be not backward in the entertainment of these soldiers, if you esteem it a happiness. In a word, you are a conqueror, and the audacious Argives have paid their lives as sacrifices to your offended sword. A messenger of comfort to a despairing lover is less ex a less acceptable thing than this thy presence. If what yon fellow told me were untruth, thy welcome sight hath amply made amends for those tormenting fears he put me to. But if it were not, let me know what chance redeemed you. If you have heard how things then went when I sent away that messenger. Yes, I have heard it. Then no, when death and our own fates had sworn our ruin, and we, like some strong wall that long <clears throat> resists the iron vomits of the flaming cannon, at last shakes itself into a dreadful ruin, to those who throw it down, so had the Iberians, with valour great as the cause they fought for, strove with a noble envy, who should at first outgo his fellow in slaughtering the Argives. At last, oppressed with multitude and toil, we sunk under the unequal burden. Then was our emulation changed, and who before strove to outdo each other, now eagerly contended to run the race of death first. Sir, there it was I and many other braver captains fell, being one wound from head to foot. Oh, t'was then it was Inopolis came in with about twenty other gallants, and with what speed the nimble lightning flies from east to west, or redeemed this bleeding trunk which the insulting Argive had encompassed, blown up with victory and pride. <laughs> He, with a gallantry like none but great Inopolis, being bravely backed by his own soldiers, 
whose actions spoke them more than men, had not Enophilus been why, redeemed the honour of a bleeding day? And thus were our troops, as little now as their valour great, enriched with victory, blood, and jewels, of which the opposite army wanted no store, returned with the renown of an achievement as full of glory and honour to the conquerors as ruin to the Argives. But my liege, had this action and my merit been so great as our prince would make it, I then might own it and respect, expect reward. But it was so small, so much below my duty, that I must upon my knees beg pardon that I came no sooner. This is a prodigy beyond whatever yet was wrote in story. Enophilus, we have been too backward in cherishing thy growing virtue. We will hereafter mend it. And, dear Renatus, be proud of thy brave son, and let the people honour the remaining army. We shall esteem it as a favour done to us. We have a large F for your valorous captains. We have not fought in, you have not fought in vain. This day, let our court put on its greatest jollity, and let none wear a discontented brow, for where a frown is writ, we'll think it reason to say that faith has characters of treason. And they all lived happily ever after. Um, so, yeah, we get... Uh, <laughs> I really enjoyed this. You know, Renata's coming on going, King, what, what are you doing? You're sending him off with no no men. And, and he's going, oh, what? No, 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 no. He, he's supposed to retreat if that thing happens. <laughs> oh, God, my son's an idiot. Um, <laughs> this, he doesn't say that, but there is a sort of thing of him just going... I sent you out to war, but I didn't tell you to kill you. No, that's not the aim of the exercise. No, just just do some basic military manoeuvres and and fine. It's not carte blanche. Um, and yeah, and, and we get this epic epic story of his death. He just wanders in. <laughs> it's just, I just think it's brilliant. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. It's great. Uh, Lynn. <laughs> I really don't know what's going on with Ephorbus when the courtier tells him, you're going to get your son killed, whether he has a genuine change of, whether it's like, well, no, I didn't mean him to actually fight the guy. I'm not. Well, that's the, the I mean, earlier when he's perfect. talking to the audience, all he says is, uh, I have him removed. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, I need not fear his magic at this distance. He doesn't talk about him dying. He's just talking about having him sent far away. So it does seem that it might be a genuine error. I could be yeah, wrong on this I, point. I, the text was made... it just a misunderstanding? Or yeah. does he change his mind? It's like, oh, shit, that was like... The reality of the fact that he sent his son to get killed hits him and he has and he's remorseful? Or whether he's like, oh, tell him not to, not to endanger himself. And that's actually just the king pretending to care. He really wants... Plan just dead, and when Plan just shows up, he faints because it's like, oh no, I thought you were dead, and I wanted you to be dead. So I don't. But it might be Plan I... just just has a death wish. I mean, in the previous scene, it, you know, that he's being all noble and he's going out there, and yes, okay, the the the, the, yeah. the, the, the army is very badly served, but maybe they've just got a shit army. I mean, maybe it's just. As it sounds like they do that they're untrained and stuff. But I just I I still don't know what Eophorbus's motivation for sending his son in the first place and then recalling him so suddenly it, i don't i i don't know that's actually made clear for us well i think he can call him back because he's sort of done he's done the you know he's chatted with uh you know Got him out of the way to, 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 to she's out of the way i'll go to sarah yeah all right. yeah i mean also i i feel there's probably been more than one miscalculation here on the part of the king because you know he's like oh i'm gonna send him away get him out of the way send him at a distance he won't be any threat to me i'll be able to you know seduce his concubine that's fine but then the messenger says that the enemy are like 16 miles away which is not is not a great deal you know and i'm thinking well 16 miles you know, Enophilus was saying earlier that oh, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be going to war b with these guys because we don't have enough men, you know, ready to to go yet. But it's like if they're sixteen miles away, they should probably be going out there anyway, <laughs> even, if, <laughs> even if it's a last ditch attempt. Because you know, sixteen miles is not that far. If they've got that far, then the king's got other things to worry about, Short frankly. Militia, quick. Yeah. <laughs> Every man for himself. Um, so it could be, my, my point was in, in response to Lynn, it could be that he didn't actually realise they were quite so close and that the threat was quite that real. 
Mm. Maybe. Who knows? I, I mean, I, I, I mean uh, taking a Doyleist approach to this, I, I feel that maybe just uh, uh, the actor playing in Forbes is really good at fainting. Um, <laughs> and, you know, because they want to create a situation where he can do it twice uh, in a scene and, and for different reasons. I mean, I'm really interested in the, the, the intended audience effect on this as well, because surely that is humorous. Um, I mean, it, it is it, but we then we have a really effective scene between Euphorbus and uh, and Romana as well. I mean, that, that that there's something there for actors to get their teeth into that it, you know, and it is a bit melodramatic, but it's still also quite good. Um, so I'm sort of looking at this going, well, then then we're not talking about a, a, a ridiculous scene with the armies. We're talking about saying a scene that is deliberately structured this way for for certain audience responses. And it feels like this play is about all about the audience response, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, is is, is uh, you know, I mentioned in passing melodrama and talking about that as a, as a very specific form of thing, not yeah. not as a, a criticism. It's a very specific uh, f way of play, because when we talk about what is uh, if Orbis doing, he's doing whatever he's doing that moment in that scene um, and that there isn't necessarily a through line, um, though we could construct one. Um, but that's a sort of modern acting question. That's not necessarily an early modern acting question. Uh, Lois. Yeah, I mean, that's more or less what I was, was thinking, that uh, uh, the, the point seems to be to have as many surprising changes as possible. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, also, I couldn't figure out why uh, Renatus was talking about my Enophilus at the beginning, but I hadn't realized that was his son. Mm -hmm. And he's furious, apparently, because he's heard that Enophilus has decided to sit out the war because he thinks it's dumb. And uh, that's why the first thing that happens when all these people unexpectedly arrive back while well, the king faints and then Renatus pr proceeds to berate Enophilus for behaving so atrociously. Then he discovers from the interminable messenger speech that actually Enophilus has saved the day. He didn't just go home. He came back with some friends and the 20 of them were enough to rout the enemy army and uh, and now the remaining army all six of them or whatever is actually left from this battle uh, are going to be feasted or something i mean the whole thing is idiotic uh i i assume it's meant to be funny i, I mean either that or it's mm. terrible <laughs> I don't. I, I. I. think it can be somewhere between the two. Um. I. I genuinely. I. I think this is this. Is, by the way, the play is structured as well. This is played not for a pl uh, a company of any size. It seems to be. I mm -hmm. mean, we're able to read it with four people with doubling. You couldn't do on stage, but yeah. it's not actually that much larger a company. So all of this stuff about describing the battle and doing all this stuff is presumably structural in the sense we don't have an army. We're not even going to have enough people to walk off from one side of the stage to the <laughs> other with an alarm going on. Um. Um, you know, it, it is purely we have to do the messenger speech, even though this is not a neoclassical drama where you have a messenger coming on. We're going to have to do that because we don't have enough bodies. And so I'm, I'm really curious. I have no idea what the auspice of this this text is. Who, who's it for? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because because structurally it's really weird. Um, but I say it's really engaging. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, Sarah. Yeah, you say structurally it's really weird, but I, I'm actually, I'm really enjoying the structure of it because it's, you know, it, it, it's like it's constantly, it's very playful. You know, it was playing games with us all the way through the, the beginning, the early scenes, like keeping us in suspense. Who is this guy? What's wrong with him? Oh, he's got a lady. Who is she? What's her, what's her situation? Um, and I mean, this, this plot is not like, you know, a particularly new plot but it, it just seems to be handling it in a very playful way and i really the fact that that messenger speech you know that kind of took me by surprise it, it went on and on and on and i'm sure that's deliberate i i don't believe for a second that 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 wasn't meant to be performed in a comic way especially then given that you know plangus then just walks on immediately afterwards i mean the the comic timing of that is joyful so yeah, I think it's it's got a really playful structure and I'm actually quite impressed with with what it's doing with the structure and, and how the playwright has just kind of brought all these, you know, fairly hackneyed themes together and done something really, really fun and, you know, quite fresh with them. Um, and I, yeah, I think for, a, for a, I don't know about the audience at the time, um, who, who it was playing to at the time, but I think a modern audience would really enjoy enjoy this. You could actually lean into that um, 
comedy and that sort of slight mm -hmm. slight whimsy that it that the text has and 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 create a really <laughs> rewarding piece of um of drama yeah, or I, comedy I, I, I generally this is this is this is appealing to my barnstorming uh side of my my my, my personality of just going this, this this is one to just pull out um because uh, yeah i bet you've got you know this, this genuinely very a very effective scene between Euphorbus and uh, Andromana, uh, we, you know, which we haven't really talked about very much. Um, but, you know, because sh she's doing all this plague. Oh, what, really? You're the king? Um, oh, you mentioned your husband, Leon's dead. And oh, cry, cry, cry. Um, and of course, we, kn you know, we know that this, this, is, this is play acting. So that gives the actor something really enjoyable to do. And the audience something very enjoyable to, 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 to view. Um, and, and yeah, and because... You know, OK, there's about 12 named parts, um, but, you know, the, 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 mm -hmm. some of these might might move around a bit. But, um, yeah, even the messenger has a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, never underestimate messenger. Uh, OK, any other thoughts about the close before we go into final thoughts? Um, OK, uh, so um, it's quite scalable. Um, it's it's. There's lots of questions about what you do with tone and where you pitch this. Mm -hmm. I think you've got to embrace some humour because for a modern audience, they're going to laugh. They're going to laugh, regardless of what the original mm -hmm. audience response was supposed intended to be. Um, but it's, yeah, it just keeps you guessing and it keeps you moving. Um, and it's quite fun um, so far. Uh, Lynn, any final thoughts you want to throw in? Oh, um, I'm not having as much fun as, as some of the rest of you are. Um... But I just think because melodrama is not my favorite favorite genre, um, uh, I, I I find the lack of visible motivation um, a, a a bar to my enjoyment. Uh, so the, the and also, I didn't, the, the, you know, there isn't uh, motivation. There's too many motivations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe that's it. Um, so I'm having a little trouble engaging with it it was probably because i you know it says it's a tragedy on the title page and um and it uh, starts out like feeling like a tragedy um so i think maybe if i had known that it was it was going to be sort of tragedy send up i'm almost um i i would probably be in, enjoying it more so i'm just having a, a little bit of a hard time getting on its its wavelength but we'll see what happens tomorrow well it's interesting because this week um this isn't necessarily how these are going to be released so uh, this may not be helpful for the viewer but this week we're also going to be reading hoffman um which that you know a is a tragedy but it's also a hoot um <laughs> uh, of ridiculousness um uh, and so it's it's interesting this this question of where do you place humor in in something mm -hmm. that is presumably going to end with a lot of bodies on stage i mean that's just an assumption by by calling anything a tragedy i'm assuming nobody's died yet uh, apart from an offstage character who we never met, um, uh, so that's 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 an interesting question um, uh, on that front. Uh, Alan, well, and and an awful lot of uh, unnamed characters who yeah, are just yeah, the poor the... bloody infantry. Yeah, so again, nobody cares. No, nobody cares. No, absolutely, they're they're they're, they're terrible uniforms. So therefore, they they, they are cannon fodder. Um, um, so yeah, uh, Alan, any final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's moving at a nice pace. Um, I do wonder whether there's elements in here of pastiching a lot of what would have then been a very established theatrical canon. Mm. Um, I mean, we've picked up uh, references to the King Lear um, play. There's also echoes in there of famous victories. Mm. I picked up in one or two places, and I'm just wondering whether this was almost, oh, well, all, all of these memes are about there. Let's just take the mick out of Well, I think the, the, the thing is actually what this text is riffing off are stuff we haven't really read yet in this room. Um, mm. So, you know, we, we, once we dig into the Bowman and Fletcher canon, uh, you, you may mm. notice um, some similarities. Uh, I think that would be fair to say, in, in the sense that the, the from where we've been mostly reading onwards, 
uh, there is there is increasingly uh, a lot of plays which mechanically go, OK, and how do we turn on a sixpence now? How do we change direction now? And there's a lot of that coming up. Uh, so in a sense, we're looking at the end point of that as a convention. And maybe this is the point where it's it, it's it's taken to a degree where, you know, shall we shall we bother with intention or shall we just do the effect? And that seems to be what they're doing here. Uh, Lois, any final thoughts? Yeah, I guess that's about it. I, uh, and I have read some of the plays of this is riffing off. Uh, and uh, I think that the name Plangus is found in Sydney's Arcadia, but I can't remember if this plot is vaguely related to one of the many little plots in the Arcadia. But uh, but the whole thing just seems so familiar. I mean, all the hearty soldiers who hate peace and want a war, the uh, people that are thought to be dead and then come back having performed amazing feats in the army, the femme fatale, the lustful king, the um, sort of semi-incestuous setup um, with both uh, father and son after the same woman. I don't know, it all it all just sounds so terribly familiar. and. And it's all done so quickly. I mean, there's one scene in which, as far as I can see, Plangus is uh, sort of told to leave by his father. And uh, within five minutes, we're told that he's now off with the army, uh, uh, battling some foreign foe. Uh, I mean, it's partly that everything just seems to be done very fast, which again makes me think that what we have here may be a kind of first draft, well, first draft, third draft, I don't know, something that hasn't been really given final form yet. Uh, mm. You know, again, I think about what uh, what Margaret Cavendish wrote, that she she understood that plays were sort of stitched together by some sort of expert, that you got the great man in to write the, the scenes, and then somebody else kind of uh, connected them and provided motivation, entrances and exits. I mean, it kind of looks like something waiting for somebody to do that. Yeah, and if, if it is a text from the very end of our period, uh, interrupted by a, a civil war, maybe maybe it hasn't had the, the stress testing that, that putting it on, actually on stage would have done. Uh, or, or alternatively, it's gone the other way. It was a longer text that's been cut back in because... And that's something that does actually happen with plays, is that you can... You, you remove all the extraneous intermediary stuff just to get for an exciting pasty adventure and actually th there was motivation and there was all this stuff but we cut it for time purposes and some of it doesn't quite make sense anymore but it's fine because it just keeps moving um and that's happened to my plays on more than one occasion um and and it's you finish a run at the end of you know to say going to edinburgh um and you look at the script afterwards and you go that doesn't actually make sense did anyone notice that? No. OK. Um, and, you know, it, 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 so it might be the, the other way around um, or for all sorts of reasons. Um, but it's 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 not like there are any inconsistencies where we're going, right, something needed to have happened. It's just things happen very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and brevity is, is always to be admired in a script of this period, in a sense. Uh, Alan, uh, then Sarah. Yeah, I mean. We're talking about a piece which is what, about 17 and a half thousand words. So mm. it's, a, it's what, two hour show, roughly? Yeah. Well, it depends on pacing. But yes, that's it's, it's, it's approaching the Rubicon where you can't you can't go under two hours. Um, uh, Sarah, any final thoughts? Well, I'm I'm loving it, honestly, um, but I do love the bonkers plays. I, I love Hoffman as well. I really enjoy tragedies that have quite a lot of humour built into them. Um, and I really love the speed of it as well. Um, it gives it, it's exhilarating. Um, it also adds to the glee of the potential comedy. It has a kind of, like I said, playful. It has a, a, a playful glee to it. Um, and then if we end up with a massive pile of bodies on stage at the end, that's just going to be hilarious or not, maybe. It depends how it's done, really. Um, I'm looking forward to finding out. Um, I do take Lynn's point about, well, it was your point, actually, about the fact that there are too many motivations. But I, I, you know, that, OK, that's a potential swamp that you have to navigate. But I think, you know, putting my director's head on for a second, you just once you have an overall, um, you know, view of the play, which I don't have yet, to be fair, I, I may be eating my words tomorrow. Um, you just you you chart, you chart uh, that 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 potential swamp, you know, you navigate it, you, you, you pick a motivation, you pick a right, okay, so we're going to say that this is happening. And he says this because X, Y, Z. Um, and, and you do that for whatever reason, whatever you want to highlight in the play, whether you want to highlight the comedy or highlight the tragedy or whatever. Um, and then you just go with it. Um, and I just think this is 
a, a cast could have a massive amount of fun with this um, and an audience could too. So, yeah, I'm. it's a thumbs up from me. Yeah, and I think maybe the, 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 the thing, the reason why Sarah and I are reacting mostly, uh, uh, most positively to this is, you know, this is, this is very much an actor's text, isn't it? <laughs> it's not much for a director to do here. It's true. There's not been a dud part so far. And, and, and even what Lois was saying about, you know, the, the stereotypes, you know, the crusty old soldiers, they're just so much fun. It's mm. like, you know, it is, it is a, yeah, it is an actor's text, probably. Yeah. yeah. The, the question really is going to be the proof of the pudding. Is it is it the actors are enjoying the show? <laughs> the audience just wants us all to go away, um, <laughs> which we will only know uh, by doing it. Uh, frankly, we can we can we can yeah. uh, we can question it. We can ask that question. But actually, it's only when you actually start doing it um, in uh, in earnest that you start getting a sense of whether a text has those kinds of legs. Um, I, I say I, I, it's not a very uh, it's not a text with 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 a great deal of depth. So it is that question? You know, is it a play that you can you can you can watch endlessly and get more out of it? No, no. But you can enjoy it, um, or so the evidence suggests at this point. Um, well, that's uh, any other final thoughts to throw in before I close the session? No. Right. Well. Uh, we have one more session to find out how it all ends. I'm sure it's going to end up all cheerful and happy and everyone's going to be singing a lovely song about friendship and, uh, and uh, living happily ever after. So all that remains, thank all the wonderful readers for all their wonderful reading. Thank you very much, everyone, and goodbye. I love a man runs laughing upon death. 